This podcast is brought to you by Podspot Events. Hello and welcome to the Bondi Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Beattie. The guest on this episode is Bella Massey, founder of Immersive Freediving. I first met Bella back in 2021 when I did the two-day Learn to Freedive course with Immersia and Bella as my teacher. In this episode, we talk about the beautiful side of freediving, the more extreme side of the sport where people dive down hundreds of meters, and we also talk about the wider benefits of freediving, including physical health, mental health, and social health. I hope you enjoy this episode, and if you are curious about freediving, I would encourage you to get in touch with Bella and the Immersive Freediving team. As always, Remember to give us a follow on Instagram at the Bondi Podcast to stay up to date with all of our guests and episodes. Like and subscribe to our YouTube channel and you'll find all of our episodes on Spotify. Cheers. Bella, welcome to the Bondi Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for coming in for a chat. Look, you know the drill. First question we ask all our guests, what's your favourite thing about Bondi? Okay, I knew you'd ask this, so I've been thinking about it. And I think for me, it is the um, the sort of dynamic nature of the of the village and the pace of change and the fact that year on year, there are always new festivals, new shops, new restaurants, new things coming to the area. So it never feels um, stagnant. It feels like there's always something new and fun and creative going on. So you could live here for a decade and never feel like you're in the same place. And it's lured you back in. You went away over to Manly for a little bit. I did. I crossed the bridge. I went to the dark side. And then I went even further and I moved about four hours north of Sydney. Um, and now we're back in Bondi because this was this was the place where I think we were happiest and where um, I was most involved in the business and felt like I had a sense of community. So, yep, here we are. I'm just trying to afford it now. Yeah, that's it. Yes. Happier that you're back? Yes. Yeah, I feel great now to be back. It's just, it's... I don't know. It has a different. It has a different buzz, Bondi, and now I can do the Bondi Manly comparison, and I'm very much in Team Bondi. Team Bondi, yes. beautiful. Yeah. Um, like you're just back from a free driving retreat in the Maldives. How was that? Oh my gosh, it was um, probably the best free diving related trip we've ever done. It was incredible. We spent. Um, I was out there for about ten days, and we had we ran a one week long retreat diving with. Um, three to four meter tiger sharks every day which was unbelievable like really brought up all kinds of things for all kinds of different people and it really makes you feel pretty humbled when you're in the water making eye contact with this four meter predator and um, yeah it was just exceptional a warm water blue water amazing beaches it was just like what sort of uh, what sort of things were coming up for for yourself and for the guests I think, well, the, the most immediate thing for me as an organizer was just safety, right? Like there's, I'm conscious of my own safety for sure, but I'm also looking all around. I'm very aware of all um, our guests are and the proximity that they have to these incredible animals. And uh, I think my sort of risk sensors were going off left, right and center. Um, it, it turned out to be a lot more manageable than I thought it would be. Um, but the first time I had my own kind of eye contact moment with a shark it was this crazy mixture of fear and awe and feeling so completely um out of control and um I actually just I when I was there I remembered this scene all of a sudden from Jurassic Park when they have to sit absolutely deadly still so the t-rex doesn't see them and all I could do was just stay absolutely deadly still holding my breath and just watching this like beautiful animal cruise over the top of me um so yeah pretty pretty amazing stuff and if you hadn't stayed still what would have happened um probably nothing honestly these these sharks are these particular sharks are very habituated to humans um they're there every day there are scuba divers and free divers in the water so um the sharks kind of know what's up but you can never lose sight of the fact that it is still a wild animal it could still do a lot more damage to you than you could to it. You're in their territory. You're totally in their territory, which, you know, we know as divers. And of course, I've chosen to put myself in that situation. Um, so I don't believe that anything bad would have happened. But um, hey, I wasn't willing to take the risk myself, right? Mm, absolutely. And was that your favorite moment? Or do you have like a favorite moment of your the entire the entire trip? In the water moment? Absolutely. Like four meter tiger shark cruising over the top of me absolutely beautiful how good 
Yeah, amazing. it was amazing. We'll have to get you to come on the next one. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah I'd love to. Like, I saw, I saw some of the footage from the most recent trip, yeah. just down there with those tiger sharks. Just looked incredible. It's amazing. Mm. Yeah, it's amazing. These are the kind of things that you... Um, when you're not a diver, when you're not a free diver, you look at this at this type of footage and think, like, never. I could never, right? That's just a different world. But it's amazing how fast the transition is between kind of discovering diving and, and building up a little bit of water competence and suddenly seeking out some of the most, quote, unquote, extreme um, animal interactions you could possibly have. And um, I think it's kind of interesting. It's almost like... Um, it's almost like people's risk appetite changes because they're just so stoked to be in this world that most people don't get to access. And so they start to seek out these really extraordinary moments and interactions. Um, I guess it's like the equivalent of you or I going and seeking out an interaction with an actual tiger or an actual lion. And that's not super accessible to us above the surface, right? But in the ocean, all these things are accessible to you. It's amazing. Yeah, incredible. So Bella, we're here today to talk about free diving and, you know, maybe for those who don't know exactly what it is, they've maybe heard the term in your own words, what, how would you describe free diving? What is it? Free diving is the art of holding your breath and sinking down beneath the surface into the water. So um, when we think of things like spearfishing, underwater hockey, mermaiding, synchronized swimming, these are all versions of free diving. I suppose when you look at free diving as a sport, you're looking at a sport that or a discipline that's all about long breath holds, deep dives, um, sort of going, going pretty deep into what the body is capable of in terms of both breath hold and, and distance you can travel in the water. Hmm. And how did you get into it? Um, when I first, so you can probably hear from my accent and you also know, Chris, I'm not from um, Australia, I'm from the UK and like many British people, when I came to Australia, I had pretty much zero water skills. I could swim. I had my, I think I had my like puff in 25 meter badge from when I was six years old. And that was my swimming career. Um, and when I first got to Bondi, I saw everybody enjoying the water. I saw people going out kayaking, surfing, ocean swimming in the morning. And I wanted a piece of what everybody had, but I didn't have a skill to enjoy the ocean with. So like most people new to Bondi, I took some surfing lessons. My surfing career was over pretty quickly. <laughs> um, and then I actually met somebody who became very influential in my life. And um, she had just been on a trip to Tonga in the South Pacific where she'd been swimming with humpback whales. And she was showing me the pictures of her trip. And the pictures would be like huge humpback whale, tiny little human. And it blew my mind that she could be just under the surface like that without any kind of scuba gear or without any equipment. And I was like, how, how is this possible? And she goes, oh, it's real simple. You just hold your breath and dive down, <laughs> which I mean, it, it kind of is that simple, right? There, there are some more, there are some complexities there, but that was my first introduction to free diving. That was the first kind of moment I became aware of the sport. And that image of her with the humpback whale was so motivating for me. And I bought my first mask and snorkel from Kmart. And How long after seeing that image? Oh, within a week, probably. Wow. I was so excited by the prospect and so desperate to be able to enjoy the ocean, you know. So um, bought my I remember it so vividly, like bright yellow mask and snorkel and bright yellow set of flippers. And I thought I was cool as hell. <laughs> I thought I was so badass. I had a wetsuit that didn't fit me properly. Um, and she she took me out snorkeling at um, Ben Buckler. And I was so scared. Just like snorkeling to start? Just snorkeling. Yeah, okay. yeah just snorkeling. And it was terrifying. I, You know, like every time I saw a patch of seaweed, I, w I would just imagine that there were creatures in there that wanted to eat me. And if I lost sight of her for a moment, I'd be like, there's a shark coming. <laughs> it, was, it was terrifying. But... Um, but I was determined. So we went very regularly and eventually I met my now husband who was a spearfisher and, um, he would take me out, you know, he'd be diving deep and I would just be flapping on the mm. surface like an idiot watching him. And, um, famously on one of our earliest dates, I got hit by a wave getting out of the water and dragged along 
the flat rock at Ben Butler, Ooh. losing like you know half the skin on my Ooh. legs, and um, there are there are all these photos of me in my stupid wetsuit with my stupid yellow flippers, just blood dripping down my legs, Mate. and so. Um, but I kind of love that picture because that's like the before, okay. you know, and um, and so yeah, snorkeling became a little bit of diving down and being curious about what was in that patch of seaweed or under that ledge. And then um, eventually I bit the bullet and I went overseas to the Philippines to do my first free diving course. Right. And uh, when I first arrived there, I, you know, I had barely any skills, but by the end of a two day course, I was doing over three minute breath holds. I was diving 11 or 12 meters deep, which for me was huge. And um, I don't know, it just like, it just unlocked this thing that I didn't know at that time would become super life-changing for me. What feelings can you remember sort of coming up, Bella, at that time when you were sort yeah. of doing those two to three minute breath holds and, and getting down to 11 or 12 meters? I think for the breath holding side of things, at first it was super challenging, right? Trying to understand all the things that my body was telling me, um, but also kind of rewarding to be able to understand those signals that you're receiving and detach from them and make a decision about whether or not you want to um, react to them and then after a few breath holds I sort of got into this state of just real like bliss and calm and I remember distinctly um, on my last breath hold of the session I felt like it had probably been 30 or 40 seconds I didn't feel like it had been very long at all and I came up and the instructor showed me the time and it was just over three minutes wow. and I was like oh my god and even now, I still remember that breath hold as like the pinnacle. That's what we all want, right? We all want a long breath hold that feels like a short breath hold. It was so relaxing. Um, and then I remember what it was to feel like free in the, in the water, to be able to um, move my body however I wanted without any gravity or um, throw out a backflip or swim through a tunnel in the rocks and just just be able to move however you want without the limit of your own weight or your own flexibility. Um, that was a beautiful feeling. So very addictive. Yeah. Okay. So you talked, you touched on it a little bit there about the sort of the signals that are going off in your body. What's actually going on in the body? Let's, let's just use a simple 10 or 11 meter dive as an example. What's going on in the body? Physiologically. Yeah. yeah. Nice. So, when you start your dive, the first and most immediate thing you become aware of as a diver is the change in pressure. So um, without being too technical, you and I are always experiencing um, atmospheric pressure. We have the weight of the, of the air around us and it presses down on our bodies. But when we go into the water, we're dealing with not only the weight of the atmosphere, but also the weight of the water above us. And so the first thing, the, the first moment you become aware of that is when you feel a bit of a pressure change taking place in your in your ears. Um, I think most people probably know what that pressure change feels like because it's kind of similar to what you get on a plane. And what that is, is basically the air spaces in your head are starting to squeeze and compress. So you need to start managing that by equalizing as you descend deeper and deeper. And unfortunately, the need to equalize never disappears. You will need to continue to equalize. The and equalizing deeper and deeper bell is just... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So hold, basically, there are so many different techniques, but yeah, basically holding your nose and pushing air against your nose to get the air into the tubes like in your ears. And then yeah. Totally, exactly, like a little exhale. Mm. So um, you need to start doing that immediately. Now, um, the other cool thing that's happening in your body is while all this pressure change is taking place in your face and in your air spaces, your lungs are also starting to compress and your body is responding to that change in the size of your lungs by sending your blood away from your fingers and toes and into your core to protect the lungs with a liquid barrier, which is actually crazy when you think about it. The fact that our lungs can um, become protected by like a layer of blood, which means we can go much, much deeper than we ever thought humans could, mm. could go. I think there was a time not long ago where we all thought that humans would only be able to dive maybe 50 meters deep, but the deepest free dive ever is 214 meters. So thanks to the guy who was willing to put his body on the line so that we could find out more about the human body. Wow. Um, 
we could get you there in a couple of years, I reckon. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I was watching uh, The Deepest Breath as we were sort of doing a bit of prep for, yeah. for this conversation. And yeah, I'll, I'll get that 100 meter dive, no bother. Another interesting thing that's happening in the body at the same time is something we refer to as the mammalian dive reflex. That's broadly a set of physiological adaptations that your body has and goes through when the body knows it's entering a water state. So as soon as you have cold water on your skin, particularly your face, your heart rate starts coming down ever so slowly. Um, your blood all moves into the core of your body to protect those sort of core internal organs and brain. Um, and that, of course, sends your blood pressure up because all the fluid is coming in into your center which is why your heart rate starts to relax and starts to come down. Um, so for freedivers, obviously, that's super helpful because we want to be able to relax the body, have a nice slow heart rate, which ultimately means a longer breath hold. Um, and as you dive deeper and you put your body under the immense pressure that comes with deep water, that extra fluid that's just entered the space around your lungs actually protects your lungs. And that's why humans are able to dive so much deeper than we used to think they could because we thought surely there's a point at which the lungs would simply collapse under the pressure of the water. But humans are diving to 200 meters plus, right? And so this, um, this adaptation, which is similar to lots of marine mammals, allows us to dive deeper than we ever thought possible and hold our breath longer than we ever thought possible too. Have there, Bella, have there ever been any studies into mammalian dive reflex and why humans can sort of still do it, I suppose. I suppose it's is it just a quirk of evolution that we can still do it? It's look, it as far as we're aware, it is a quirk of evolution. And it and it makes sense, right? I mean I mean, we are of the water originally. And so in the freediving world we often talk about the mammalian dive reflex as something that was left over from our ancient, ancient water days. Um but one of the things that I kind of love about this sport is all these weirdos that practice freediving are at the forefront of what we know about the human body. And so sometimes we will have a scientific theory about what's possible. And then some, some absolute psycho will come along and say, that's cool. I'm going to disprove that theory. <laughs> I'm going to be the one to dive 200 meters deep and see if my body can cop it or not. And then we go, oh, okay, cool. I guess that's possible. And then we sort of work to catch up. But look, you can imagine, right? Freediving is so is so young as a um, serious sport and it's still really kind of growing in terms of the public imagination and, and in terms of scientific attention too. So I'm super excited to see what's going to happen in the next five, 10 years as we start to study freediving more and we start to look at the, um, the ways that breath holding can be used by different kinds of athletes um, and also just how we can use freediving to um, amplify our own lives and performance. So I, I think it's I think it's going to be a really interesting few years around freediving and what we know about the human body. Absolutely. Watch the space. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Hopefully some really cool things coming out of that. Yeah, well. absolutely. Yeah. And you talked, Bella, a little bit about, well, you sort of had that, it, it felt addictive. Yeah. So where did you yeah. go for, so you did this course over in the Philippines, was it? That's right, yeah. And you got a taste for the sport right where did where did you take it from there oh my gosh well um I'd actually just I'd just taken a little break off work a little sabbatical and what were you doing at the time um, Bella, you were in I corporate? Was, yeah I was in corporate I was working for a management consulting okay. company and um it had been on my to-do list for a number of years to take a bit of time off and do some travel and so I got this opportunity at a slow slow time at work so I took five months off work I went to the Philippines got completely addicted to free diving, cancelled many of the next plans to reorganize myself around going to Bali and Hawaii and to these places where I could dive. Um, and weirdly at the time I thought, oh, I'm going to learn to be a scuba instructor, but scuba kind of fell off the agenda pretty quickly once I discovered free diving. It's like really hard to argue with the simplicity and the spontaneity of free diving. You know, scuba is just an extra layer of planning and when you're in your sort of mid-20s frolicking around Southeast Asia planning two days in a you know planning a scuba tank two days ahead is not really mm. a high thing on your priority list so um so I went full obsessed mode into free diving was able to explore all these beautiful places and dive um 
in amazing conditions with dolphins and with really interesting people and have all these beautiful marine interactions. Uh, and then I came back to Sydney and had to kind of relearn free diving in colder, darker, murkier conditions. But um, I kind of knew, I kind of had a sense then that this was going to be really important in my life. And so I was willing to put in the work and get into a kind of training rhythm and get um, connected into the freediving community in Australia and so uh, yeah I went to work on freediving and simultaneously my sort of attention span in my corporate job started dropping and dropping and I'd find myself sitting at the desk thinking about getting back in the water and thinking about where I was going to go diving that weekend and much to the delight of my parents I ended up quitting that job to uh, to pursue freediving full-time. Wow we and we sort of talked about the two aspects of, of the sport, that that more the more aesthetic side of the sport where you, you sort of dive down and you're just being totally present and amongst the, the conditions and the sea life around you, but also that side of the sport where people just dive to go deep, right? When you were sort of in this phase of your life and you were travelling around all these places doing the diving and you've come back to Sydney and joined the, the free diving community here, what side of the sport were you more leaning toward at the time it's it's a it's a really good question so um my relationship with the sport has kind of gone back and forth a little bit between being purely recreational you know in it for the experience in it for the marine interactions and um I suppose more focused working towards specific goals um working towards competition working towards um different levels of certification and uh I suppose that kind of that dynamic, even that conflict maybe, has followed me around and I think follows a lot of people around in the sport. I think a lot of people come to freediving because they love the idea of accessing a different world and um, maybe tapping more deeply into something in themselves. But um, if you have the smallest little inkling towards competitiveness, which I do and which many people do, you quickly find a numbers game in this sport. Mm. You know, you for me, that first three minute breath hold was, it, it became an expectation that every breath hold would be three minutes. And so then I had to work towards four and then I had to work towards five. And um, I see it all the time now with my students who come and learn free diving. Everybody walks in saying, oh, well, if I can dive 10 meters, that will be amazing. But the second you hit 10 meters, you want 15, everyone you wants want 20. 15, then you yeah. want 20 and you're like, I'll be happy at 30. You will not be happy at 30. It doesn't it doesn't matter. And um, I wonder if that's because there's something kind of superhuman sounding about free diving. As a free diver, if you tell somebody that you're a free diver. First question you get asked is. First question yeah. is, how deep can you go? And the second question is, how long can you hold your breath? No one says to you, what's the coolest thing you've ever seen underwater? I did. Well, yeah, yeah, I, actually, <laughs> I do now. <laughs> to make it, to prove it, to prove a point, right? But that's, that's all people want to know because free diving is this kind of, dark and weird otherworldly kind of sport um and there's a there's a real performance element to it that is, is also addictive so let's talk about competitive bella what did what did that look like what is it what does a free diving competition look like so you have two types of free diving competition um depth competitions and pool competitions so depth competitions which are the ones you mostly see on tv and in netflix documentaries um are basically a game of how deep can you dive? And there are different disciplines. So there are some disciplines with um, a, what we call a monofin, which is like a mermaid tail kind of fin, um, bifins, which are the typical flippers, and then um, no fins, which is like swimming down the line for depth. And uh, there are some very famous competitions around the world, like Vertical Blue, you may have heard of. That's the, that's the really, really deep one. There are competitions in... Um, in Egypt, in um, Central America, in Philippines, Bali. Um, and yeah, this is where the deepest people on earth come together and um, push their bodies to the absolute, absolute limits. Um, and what is kind of cool and interesting about freediving, unlike many sports, is that year on year, the world records are being beaten. It's a super interesting time to be a part of the sport because we really don't know the extent of the human body. I always um, think it's kind of like it's kind of like being a hundred meter sprinter before Usain Bolt came along. You know, we just don't know how far we can go. 
And then over on the other side, you've got the pool competitions, which are all about how long can you hold your breath? How far can you swim in a pool? And those are, I mean, the athletes that take part in those competitions are so impressive, but that those competitions probably don't get the airtime that the deep ones do because aesthetically good looking as they're not as sexy they're not as weird you know there's something about the like alien look of someone diving down to 100 meters deep that i think is just super captivating what did you do bella um i i'll be honest i do not like pool free diving i am not good in the pool i hate staring at a black line in front of my face so for me like depth is the thing depth is the area that i really like and um yeah, I've, I've had some really beautiful moments with depth training and I've had some tough moments with depth training as well. In competition? Um, no, I've actually never competed. So I, uh. I started down, I sort of started down the competitive track a few years back. And for me personally, I found that the process of training, the process of working towards competition just chipped away at my love of the sport. And, you know, I, I mentioned earlier, sometimes I can have a little bit of a competitive um, streak when it comes to activities. I, I just like to do the absolute best that I can do. And for free diving, I felt like I was getting out of the water and I wasn't getting out happy and fulfilled and excited. I was getting out of the water frustrated and um, kind of angry at myself for not having hit a PB today, for not having progressed further. Um, and when, you, when you're working for depth in particular, that mindset, that kind of self-expectation, that negative self-talk um, becomes dangerous, right? Because you start to push harder and harder and harder. And that's kind of the opposite of what you want to do when you're pushing to extreme depths and putting your body under extreme pressure. So um, for me, I made the decision to pull back from competing and focus more on teaching, which... Um, mm which I love and it's been a really good way to check myself because now I see other people, I see my students doing the same thing and I can step back and say, yeah, okay, this is, this is the exact process that I went through, right? This kind of self-competitive, yeah. um, progress-oriented journey. Yeah. We're going to get into the teaching, Bella, yeah. but I'm still a little bit more, I'm, a bit, I'm still a bit curious. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so I know you said it as a, as a numbers game. I'm interested in your numbers. How deep and, <laughs> and how long did like I, PBs? I don't, look, look, I will tell you, but when you publish this, there's going to be a whole bunch of people saying, oh, that's not very deep. She's not a real free diver. My deepest dive is just under 50 meters deep. Um, and that's in bifin discipline. So mm. with the, with the two, um, with the two long fins and, it's pretty um, pretty fucking deep when you think about it. Look, it didn't, it doesn't feel comfortable at that depth, right? So just under 50, but. Um, even saying that, I feel that little competitive voice in my head saying, it well, wasn't quite 50, it wasn't quite 50 <laughs> right? And I have to, yeah, like right now I'm checking myself like, Bella, come on. Yeah. Like, but, Let um, it go. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Like if you'd asked me six years ago, how deep do I think I would ever dive? I would have been like 15 meters and that will be really nice. But, um, yeah, you just, you just seek the next sensation and you seek the next number and, um, of course, the perfectionist in us all wants a whole figure, not 49 40, point yeah. something, right? You want the 50. So, mm. yes. But we'll see. Maybe I sort of have a goal to go back overseas and do a little bit more training at a time when life's a little bit calmer. And um, um, we'll see. I'll unleash that competitive side again and see where we where we get to. Yeah. Yeah. And um, you said you had a couple of dark moments in yes. the sort of competitive training as well. Are you talking about blackout? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what is blackout, Bella? So um, in free diving, when things go wrong, when you hold your breath for too long, you experience hypoxia, which is um, a state of low oxygen. So when your body doesn't have um, enough oxygen to function normally. Uh, and there's kind of two things that can happen. The first is what we call a loss of motor control. Um, or kind of like a seizure. So you become unable to control your movements, you become jittery, you might be unable to breathe because you can't control your own breathing. Um, and loss of motor control can be recovered quite quickly, but if you don't do anything, it can progress to a full blackout. A blackout is 
um, entire loss of consciousness as a result of holding your breath too long. So your blood oxygen um, gets too low to sustain regular life. So your body flips into this, um, into this kind of protection mode. And obviously you're unconscious. You're not aware of anything taking place around you. And everything just slows down and shuts down. Your throat naturally closes, which is pretty incredible because if you're underwater and you pass out, the most immediate risk is that you will inhale water and drown. So your throat closes, which is some like wonderful evolutionary thing that happened. Um, and your body will give you a period of time. It's different in every single case. And after that period of time, your throat will open, you'll be forced to inhale. And if you are above the water when you inhale, happy days, you inhale air and oxygen and you start breathing again. If you're under the water and that happens, you'll inhale water, your lungs will fill with water and you'll drown. So um, blackouts have got this really, um, of, of course, naturally blackouts have a terrible reputation and blackouts are something that we always try to avoid in free diving. But also having a blackout does not mean you're dead, right? Having a blackout just means you're in an emergency situation that you need to be recovered from. And sadly, you can't recover yourself from that. You have to have um, a buddy, a safety team, somebody who knows what they're doing, who can um, revive you and bring you back into consciousness. So what happened to you? So um, I was training, it was actually on my instructor course, um, and I was training with a bunch of amazing, super experienced divers. And um, I, I just, I wasn't feeling too good that day which I probably should have paid attention to, but didn't. Um, and I was on my way to do a 30 meter dive um, with no fins on though. So a swimming dive, which is a really high energy dive. You burn through a lot of oxygen on that, in that discipline. So um, I got ready for my dive. I was really worried about being too floaty and too buoyant. So I put extra weight on my belt, um, which is a really important lesson, but anyway, I put extra weight on my belt thinking it would just help me cut through the buoyancy at the surface and help me get down the line a bit quicker. And I took off, I started my swim. Things started going wrong almost immediately, but I was so focused on getting the dive done that I wasn't really paying attention. So the first thing was that my, um, my positioning on the rope started to change so that I was falling, free falling down into mm -hmm. the ocean really slowly. Um, you know, speed is important when you're diving. You don't want to waste time because you only have a limited breath hold. So I start um, sinking slower than I should. And eventually I reach 30 meters and it doesn't feel good. I can already feel that the breath hold's quite intense at that point. But again, I was so fixated on finishing this dive. So I get to the bottom of the rope. It's super dark down there. I turn around to start swimming back up. And I put my arms up and do my first big swim stroke and I can just see the bottom of the rope and it's not moving. And I start mm. pumping harder and harder and I'm swimming harder and harder and harder, but I'm so heavy now. You know, you you get heavier the deeper you go. And your lungs have... My lungs are compressed. Compressed, yeah. Exactly. My body is compressed. My wetsuit is compressed. So all the air on my body is now super compressed. I'm super heavy and I'm wearing too much weight. So... I'm swimming and swimming and trying to get up and I'm moving like excruciatingly slowly up the rope. And I know that it's wrong. I know that something needs to happen. But weirdly, I didn't, it didn't cross my mind to take any of the simple steps that I could have taken. I could have just grabbed the rope in front of me and started pulling myself up, but that didn't cross my mind. And I could have just grabbed my weight belt and dropped it into the ocean. These are things that we are trained to do. And yet in that state of hypoxia, in that state of low oxygen, I wasn't thinking rationally. I was just thinking, get this dive the hell over, just get back to the surface. And so I'm swimming and I'm swimming. And eventually I see my buddy, my buddy arrives. He's in front of me. Came down to 30 meters. He came down. I mean, at that point I was probably 25 meters, something okay. like this. So my buddy comes down to meet me. Um, which, which they should do. And we're diving together and my buddy's waving at me and giving me all these signals. But I, I, I remember that they were waving and I remember thinking, I don't know, I don't know what they're trying to communicate. So just refocus. 
And the last thing I remember seeing was my buddy's fins just like swimming up in front of my face and disappearing back to the surface. So... Were they meant to do that? Quick segue here. We are always trained as a buddy that if you don't have the breath hold to safely rescue somebody, you should leave the dive, go back to the surface, get another breath and come down. Um, and it's really important that we're trained to do that because if you or I are diving together and you black out and then I black out trying to rescue you, we both die, right? It's that simple. So, um, so it's really important for the buddy to put their own safety first. So he did the absolute right thing by swimming back up to the surface. Um, I have obviously no memory at this point. Um, it was around then that I lost consciousness. I exhaled all my air. That's normally what happens when you black out. And luckily for me, there were a bunch of other super experienced divers on the surface. One of them saw what was happening. He took off, came down, grabbed me. They pulled me back to the surface. And um, it took about 20, 20, 30 seconds, but they were able to recover me just using the like standard free diving rescue technique that we are all taught. And um, I live to tell the tale. How did you Here feel? How did you feel after? Can you like, remember? Yeah, yeah, weird, like really weird. Um, this is this is kind of morbid, but um, I remember the feeling of being brought back to consciousness was almost like being um, woken up out of a really nice dream. It was like I was resisting, like I really didn't want to come back. It was like I was in total bliss, and so. Wow the feeling of being called back, the awareness of um, sound and noise, like water on my face, was all irritating. But um, then I came round, it took a few seconds for me to realize what had happened. And then the weirdest thing happens when you, um, when you wake back up, it just kind of seems like funny. I don't know, everyone's staring at you. Everyone's got this look on their face and it's so embarrassing. So your instinct is just to like laugh it off because it didn't really happen to you. It happened to everyone else, right? So um, I was sort of giggling and laughing and I was like, don't worry, I'm fine, we're all good. Um, and my poor partner was also in the water watching the whole thing unfold and uh, he wasn't um, exactly stoked. And everyone got me back onto the boat, um, oxygen on my face. And um, for the next probably like 10, 15 minutes, I was sweet as. It was like nothing had happened. Um, but later on that day, later that evening, uh, the kind of emotional response kicked in. And I got um, very upset and, um, I don't know, maybe, maybe like a bit of delayed shock. And I had a throbbing headache, I remember that. And then... I went to bed probably at like 9 p.m. that night and slept for about 14 hours. It was, um, I mean, it's a lot on your body, right? It's a lot. And then um, in the days after that, I I guess I was just a bit shaken. I was still going in the water and I was still diving, but... The very next day? Not the next day. I had a day off the next day, but I did go back in the day after. And um, yeah, I could just feel that something was different. You know, as soon as I got the slightest urge to breathe, my mind would sort of go to, oh my God, you're going to black out. You're going to, you know, you're going to pass out. You need to stop what you're doing immediately. Um, and uh, in hindsight, I should have just taken a break and gotten out of the water. But again, I was just so, I was obsessed with finishing all of the the course requirements, obsessed with getting everything ticked off. And so I, I just kept pushing and pushing and pushing and um, comically had um, another loss of motor control a couple of days after and then another one a couple of days after and after that my coach said all right you we're pulling you out you need to you need to take like a couple of weeks off wow. and um, and that was really good advice so um, touch wood we haven't had any blackouts since then wow but yeah it was it was well I was about to say it was a scary moment but actually for me, it wasn't a scary moment. It was a scary moment for everybody else. I think for me, it just was like a, just a delayed shock. Um, and it was a big wake up call because I think on that day I'd made a series of bad decisions and all of them were driven by my own ego. Like I had to prove something. I had to make a stupid decision around my weights because I was so focused on ticking off some arbitrary number. And so that like, that made it very, very clear to me how 
with this sport, it can be really fun and really beautiful and really safe until it's not. And that line is so thin, you know? Mm. So now when I see people taking little risks that don't seem like a big deal, I'm, I'm really on top of it because it's a culmination of these little insignificant things that can lead to a really, really bad situation. Mm. And that scenario that you described where it was nearly like quite a blissful experience for you and you were resisting actually waking up. Is that common? Yeah, when it is. Across blackouts and yeah. different people, yeah. I didn't know this at the time, but it actually... So I, 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 I'm going to have to fact check this because I don't know that this is true, but I have heard that there are communities of free divers around the world that will just like hold their breath for as long as they possibly can just to experience the kind of hypoxic high. Wow. Now... We're not promoting that on the Bondi podcast, by the way. <laughs> no, 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 absolutely not. And, uh, um, and it was a, okay, I'm going to go super morbid for a moment. Oh, please do. Maybe we cut this out later. <laughs> but you kind of imagine that drowning is going to be the worst imaginable feeling, right? That feeling of suffocation. But that experience has made me fear drowning so much less because I actually think it would probably be pretty blissful like a pretty weird dreamlike state that you enter. So um, for sure, I'm not going to pursue that feeling ever again. Yeah. It definitely wasn't worth it for everybody else on the surface. And also, I'm just not in the game of putting my body through absolute, absolute extremes, you know. Yeah. For your body to go into a state of blackout, it, it suffers a lot of trauma. And there is no real research into what the long-term effects of blackouts um is or are what those long-term effects are but i'm not willing to make my body a you know a case study for that i can't imagine that the human body wants to regularly be starved of oxygen in such an extreme way that we lose control so hey guys quick favor from me it would really be helpful for the podcast if you could just take a second to make sure that you're following the podcast on spotify and that you click the subscribe button on youtube this will help the podcast grow and ensure that we can keep bringing quality guests to you guys. Thanks. Bella, we've spent a bit of time talking about blackout, which is obviously linked to that more extreme and darker side of the sport. Let's, uh, let's lighten the conversation a bit. I, I know there are so many benefits associated with freediving. There's physical benefits, social benefits, mental health benefits. Can you tell us a bit about them? Yeah, for sure. So um, in terms of mental health benefits... Anybody who spends time in the water will tell you that once you get the water into your blood, once you, um, once you create a lifestyle around the ocean, you become addicted to it. And we don't always have the language to explain what it is, but we know that the water means something to us and it does something to us. And um, I, I, are you, have you ever heard of Blue Mind Theory? I've heard of it, but I don't really know too much about it. So Blue Mind Theory is this um, sort of emerging um, field of research, and it's actually a book. It's a fantastic book um, that you can read, and it talks about all of the various um, ways in which the water changes our um, neurochemistry and causes a calm and happy and meditative state when we are ideally in the water, but even just looking at the water or close to the water. So um, the, I suppose the concept is when we... Um, feel or we see or we hear or we smell the water when we have that water association our bodies start to de-stress they start to come down away from that kind of fight or flight system um, and our bodies will start to release feel-good hormones like dopamine and serotonin um, and so you uh, you get this kind of natural meditative almost high when you're near the water and um, I think probably a lot of people who live in Bondi and a lot of people who live by the beach know this right we 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 pay enough to live by the water right <laughs> for, for good reasons so for anybody who's watching or listening this later there's a great justification for the rental increases yeah. hey it's for our meditative state <laughs> it's good for our mental health <laughs> yeah it's for our mental health and um and and we can say that now it's backed by science so yeah. um so that's that's the kind of theory around why we feel so great when we're near the water so there's that side of things also um when we're free diving we're learning to cope with some of the um, most terrifying natural state you can put your body into, right? We take away air, we take away breathing. And so you'll find when you start holding your breath, you notice that your body reacts and 
everything in you is screaming at you to get out of this super dangerous state that you're in, right? And so if you can learn, like freedivers do, to control and to sort of disassociate from that panic, then imagine what you can do when you get like a grumpy email from a client or you have a conflict at home with your partner. When these little stresses, stresses yeah, when these little just like things pop up in daily life, um, it's really nice and kind of cool to be able to say, well, oh my God, I held my breath for five minutes and that was really painful. And so surely I can deal with this shitty email in my inbox. Surely I have the, the skills to do this. Um, and so I think a lot of people find real mental health relief and, and real tools to use in their day-to-day -day lives practically in freediving. On the physical health side, of course, I mean, you're moving your body and freediving is particularly motivating. Um, so I'll, I'll share this. When I started freediving, um, like, like many Brits in Australia, you know, I was probably guilty of the odd cheeky stiggy um, and <laughs> drinking a little bit too Bella much. <laughs> and, you know, like not, not taking great care of my body. But when you start to, when you start to engage in a sport that is so much about your own physical, um, I suppose, performance, your own, your own ability to um, understand your body, you really start to respect it a little more. And for me personally as well, um, as a, you know, as a, as a woman who has gone through my whole life thinking, oh, am I too fat? Like, am I pretty enough? Brr, brr, brr. It's really hard to hate your body when you're doing long breath holds and you're diving really deep because your, your body is like indisputably amazing. And you're so appreciative of having two working lungs. So, um, for me, there's been that side too. And then finally, the social health side. So I love saying to my um, students and our community that free diving attacks your, your social health, right? It really boosts that side of your life because free diving is not a lone sport. You, you step into this sport, you step into the ocean, you have to find a buddy and you do quickly because in Sydney, especially in the East, we are um, blessed with an amazing community of free divers. And so for me as a newbie in Sydney, as a foreigner, Freediving is where I found my my crew and, and most of my friends have either come from courses and they were my students and I've just wrote them into my social life or they're people that I've met out in the ocean. And um, and you can see it in the freediving community. Somebody wants to go for a dive, they'll join a WhatsApp group or they'll throw something up on Facebook and they'll find somebody else and it just grows and grows and grows. And, um, you know, you, you turn up now at Bondi Beach on a sunny day and there could be a hundred freedivers in the water, whereas... You know, when I started seven or eight years ago, if I saw one person on the beach with long fins, I would make a beeline across the beach to go and talk to them, to make a friend. So I think it's a beautiful way to meet people too. Amazing, Bella. Do you still get that feeling um, when you go, when you see water, when you're near water, when you smell water? Can you, can you feel oh, a difference in yourself? I can, but you know, the time that I notice it the most is when I've been away for a little while, when I've been in the city or I've been traveling, I've been away from the water and then I come back to the beach and then I see it again. And it's like the smell, the sound, it's all that combination and it feels so amazing. And I can also tell you that at any point in life now, if I feel stressed or anxious or I'm in high conflict and my body's really wired, all I crave is to just have my face in the water. I just need to be submerged whether it's in a pool or a bathtub or the ocean it doesn't matter i just need that feeling of water on my skin it's so addictive yeah there's a there's a few people i know uh, in the community here at bondi and they swear by it it's and they go into the ocean every day and submerge themselves three times say yeah. three three is the magic number just to calm everything down regulate everything yeah or down regulate everything 100 yeah. percent. it's it's i mean it is it's an addictive feeling and i now see um on the beach, there's a lot of people doing ice baths and, um, you know, sort of practicing immersion in a, in a kind of different way, but um, similar thing, right? It's giving your body the chance to downregulate, to find a nice place of calm um, and to just, I don't know, get out of the, of the air and the heat of life, right? So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's beautiful. And I honestly feel I feel like lucky to have discovered it at this stage in life and just kind of bummed I didn't discover it earlier in life. But hey, you know, better late than never. Yeah, these things yeah. happen for a reason. Exactly. And they come into your life like at the right time or when they should as well, right? Yeah, I believe that actually. I think you're right. I think there's something in that.
so arguably Bella you having gone through all these experiences and, and making all these mistakes while, while you were sort of doing your training that surely made you a, bit, a better teacher right I hope so I hope it has I think um I think my students appreciate when I can talk to them from first-hand experience and I will and have never pretended that I am the perfect freediver I'm not I'm I'm like a I was a struggler. I was slow to learn the techniques. I was slow to progress depth. I had these experiences of um, blackouts and loss of motor control. And um, in many ways, I was my worst nightmare student, right? I allowed myself to be competitive and I allowed myself to um, have unrealistic expectations of my body and push myself. And so, um, yes, when I see that those behaviors and those mindsets in my students, I can be right on top of them. I'm sure that some hate it because they want to be allowed to go as deep as they possibly can, right? But um, I think it's I think it's my responsibility to share those experiences and also be really, really upfront about um, how thin that line is between doing the sport safely and doing it dangerously. Mm. So let's get into the teaching a bit more then, Bella. Yeah. So you're the founder of Immersia Freediving. That's right. Tell us the story of Immersia. Like how, how did, yeah. when did you sort of take the plunge, I suppose, from working in the corporate world and just doing free diving as a hobby to being like, right, I want to do this full time and I'm going to launch immersive free diving and teach people to, to free dive like myself. Thank you. So um, I, I've known for a really long time that I wanted to have my own business. I wanted to have my own project because it, it, I love learning and I, I really wanted to experience what it is to grow a product and grow a community. Um, but I never had my thing. I never had the product and when I started free diving it was it, it wasn't long before I knew that this would be something that I end up um, doing more seriously and um, it actually the my, the kick in the bum came in late 2019 when um, I finally got my permanent residence and um, I really hope my old boss doesn't listen to this, but I'd been waiting to get my permanent residence so that I could sort of walk away. You from, wouldn't be the first person, Bella, and you wouldn't be the last. Job. And um, so when that came through, I was like, right, I'm free. I can do the thing. But what is the thing? Um, and I, I, look, I knew I wanted to do something freediving related. I had come through the freediving industry in Sydney. And at that time, 2000, sort of 17, 18, 19, it was super male dominated. It was spear fishers. I was generally the only female in a group. It was hard to connect with other divers. Um, everything was disorganized, backyard operations. I was working in a consulting role. I could see operational inefficiencies everywhere. <laughs> and I was like, I feel like I can do this better and I can make this, um, I can make this more interesting and more inspiring to people like me to, you know, women, expats, people who are looking for new hobbies, people who are looking for more meaning in their lives, um, more purpose, more adventure. So um, in early 2020, I made the decision to um, give my notice and go overseas and spend a few months training my freediving whilst I also started building the business. Um, and I started a blog so that I could get a little bit of traction and start building an audience. And um, I quit my job in late February, 2020. <laughs> you know what's coming. I got on a plane to the Philippines to go and train for three months. And six days into my training, we were all given 24 hours notice to leave the country. Wow. Lockdown was starting. Um, so I went to the airport, got on a plane and I landed back in Sydney with no job, no income. My partner is also a freelancer. So he also found himself back in Sydney no income, no job. And um, the weight of the world was just there for us to deal with. And so it turned out to be super motivating. In a week, I built a brand, built a website, got the company up and running, did the whole ABN, ASIC, like all the steps of building a company. Um, I started writing on the blog like crazy, going hard on Instagram to try to get a little bit of traction get some like really basic affiliate sales and um, and I um, enrolled in all the courses I possibly could to progress my freediving uh, locally in Australia and I ended up taking 
two different freediving instructor courses over the next three or four months. Like during lockdown, could you still could you do this? Well, or? in Sydney, if you remember, the lockdown was not that long at the start. Yeah. But then we were limited to just being within Australia. So um, luckily for me, there were a couple of um, a couple of instructor trainers in Australia who launched courses on Gold Coast and one in New South Wales as well. So at that time, I was able to access both of those, which was amazing. Um, and then the second I had my instructor license, I just started immediately pool training, teaching courses, um, pulling in as many customers as I possibly could, saying yes to everything. I remember I was teaching snorkeling courses at one point. Um, I went and did a couple of corporate workshops. I was just doing anything I could freediving related to try to um, honestly try to just build the foundations of a business. And what, um, what really delighted me was that I started getting messages and bookings from people who were just like me, you know, um, foreigners in Sydney who were looking for new friendships and looking for new adventures. And, um, we were all stuck here, right? Everybody had a little bit of income to spare and they couldn't go anywhere. So freediving started growing really quickly. And, and I feel incredibly grateful actually that, um, I started when I did because it was right at the beginning of a huge uptick in this sport. And, um, the community started building really quickly. People wanted to make friends. People wanted to do outdoor stuff um, on the weekends and freediving was perfect for it. So uh, we started growing and growing and growing. And um, I did take on a second job at the time just to supplement my income. And after about, or well, after almost 12 months, things were going so well with the business that I quit my second job. Um, and that was June 2021, just before the five-month lockdown. So my timing has been shocking, mm. absolutely shocking. But um, here we are, 2024. The business is still alive and it is my full-time job now. And um, we've now, as of about six weeks ago, we hit the 1,000 student mark. So good. I am just delighted and so stoked and um, really happy to see the growth of freediving, particularly in places like Bondi. And I'm you know, hardships aside and bad timing aside, I am so happy I made the leap when I did. So, so happy. Let's talk, Bella, about that period um, where you'd just come back and we were in lockdown. And it just sounds you went. It sounds like you went into full hustle mode. A hundred percent, yeah. Were there ever moments of, and I get this sometimes, like even with doing this podcast, like you get moments of self-doubt creep in, no matter how much you like, you're grafting away at something and you're like, but in the back of your head or you, that's that little voice, what are you doing? Oh yeah. Yeah. So did, did you, did you get that? And how did you, if you did, how did you deal with it? Yeah, that's such a good question. I, there were, there were two big, there were two big fears I had. The first was that all the people who'd known me throughout my life, like my family, my friends from home would, um, think I'd like lost it and gone off the rails why would I walk away from a good job to start a dive business who does that in the middle of a global pandemic in the middle of a global pandemic exactly I actually I actually never told my dad that I had done it I sort of pretended like I was still in the consulting world for months because um I wasn't prepared for the conversation so I sort of hid away from that and the other thing I was really scared of was that um there would be a poor reception in the established dive community. Like here's some random English pleb who's turned up and has been in the community for five minutes and is daring to stick their head out and, um, and sort of put their name on something. I'm sure you can probably understand what that's like, right? Being, being the face of a podcast or being the face of a business is kind of scary. Mm. You're and putting yourself out there, right? And there's sometimes that makes people feel uncomfortable yeah. and the way they deal with that is you know maybe try and put you down yeah definitely and I I had a lot of that in the early stages of the business there were people who I thought would be really um, big supporters of the business who turned out not to be supporters at all um, and there were I'm not going to say conflict because it there was no conflict but certainly um, I became aware that um I was no longer in the good books of certain people in my life um, who were no longer a part of my life and that's okay and I recognize now that that's just part of the business journey sadly you know there are 
there are all kinds of there are all kinds of things that happen socially when you start a business and freediving is a very small community and not always the most friendly community. Mm. So is that something to do Bella with like teaching people on someone else's turf or uh, well, okay. That there are turf wars for yeah, sure. Okay. I also think that, you know, until a couple of years ago, freediving was so niche that there was this perception that, um, if I teach somebody to freedive, then that's your customer who I've taken away. It's mm. that kind of zero sum game attitude. Whereas the, the simple reality is that for a sport like this, if I work out how to market freediving to, I don't know, a 27 year old expat in Bondi, then that expands the market. If you work out how to market freediving to um, a 57 year old scuba diver who lives in, I don't know, in Brisbane, then you're expanding the market. We're all expanding the market in, in different ways, but certainly when I came into it, I think it was very much seen as um, some random person stepping on your turf. I remember one of the things that I've heard in the community about Immersia is that I, um, that I stole someone else's business model. I was the girl who stole the business model. And um, if the business model is teaching people to free dive, then yeah, I mean, I stole <laughs> yeah. it, right? Like I stole it in the same way that someone who opens a restaurant stole the idea of a restaurant. So yes, like guilty. I stole the idea of a free diving um, course, but uh, it's, it's been, it's probably been one of the hardest um, parts of growing this business is just trying to stay focused on the task when there's noise around you and when there's um, people talking shit and, um, trying to get under your skin and trying to derail you. Yeah. But, um, but I'm getting better at it. I'm getting a thicker skin. And when I worry and when I feel like, oh, maybe, I, maybe I'm not as popular as I should be in this community, I just look at the number of students coming through our school and I'm like, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> oh, dear. You know, it's, I think it's been a success because, um, because I've, I've found a way to communicate what freediving could mean for a population of people who resonate with that. And of course, if I took my product elsewhere, it might not work. But um, yeah, I feel really proud of where the business has come from. And of course, I'm always learning, but um, it's, it's been like a joyful experience for the most part, you know. Yeah. And uh, Yeah, well, I mean, facing those challenges, it's just really the cost of doing business, right? At the I end think of the it day. is, yeah. yeah. And I'm sure other industries have the same um, level of politics as oh, well, yeah. right? Imagine opening a gym in Bondi, right? <laughs> I, I guess. Do the exact yeah, same thing, I guess, right? I guess. You kind of think, um, you kind of think, oh, but freedivers are all zen, right? Aren't they just happy that other people are in the ocean? No. Yeah. They're not. Yeah, That's exactly. not the case, you know. But, um, hey, it gives you a thicker skin and it is really motivating. You know, sometimes I, sometimes I joke with my friends and partner if everybody at the beginning of Immersia had supported Immersia, it probably wouldn't be anywhere near where it is today. It was like quite motivating to prove the point. You know, I had to, I had to sell out courses. I had to sell out retreats. I had to have a better brand because these were, I know, these were the little signifiers that made me feel like I was on track. Mm. So if ever you want to really mess with somebody's business, all you need to do is just be nice to them, you know? <laughs> Well said. Um, Bella, I learned to free dive with you on the two day course. I think it must have been January or February 2021. So right in between the two lockdowns. Oh, yeah. So you would have only been teaching then for probably a few months. Yes. Um, for someone who's n not done the course and is thinking about doing the two day course and learning how to free dive, what can they expect? So the two day course is an, intended to be a kind of full introduction to all the fundamentals of free diving. So there's a theory component where you learn all about the physiology of your body you learn about the physics of the ocean all the things that you need to understand as a recreational freediver then there is also a pool freediving session where we teach you how to hold your breath for longer and we teach you how to get your body in a state of relaxation so that you're better prepared to deal with the things that come with that breath hold um, and then we take you to the ocean for the second day and we um, we set up a line so that you've got something to hold on to and orient your body towards and we just slowly build up your depth in various different disciplines 
Um, and then arguably the most important thing we learn all weekend is how to perform rescues. So we make everybody go through rescue training and we practice rescuing one another until everyone feels comfortable and competent in rescuing someone if they need to. Hmm. Fantastic. And uh, what's, what's next for Amartya? Um, it's, it's a good question. So the business is starting to evolve to more towards, um, I suppose, experiences for people who can already free dive. So we will always run the two day free diver course in the intro because I love to get people into this sport. But um, once you've completed your freediving course, then it's really important to get connected into a community and to start having these amazing experiences that make you feel alive, make you feel proud of your life. That's why I went wrong, Bella. I did the course and I know. didn't. You didn't get straight back didn't into it. Didn't get the straight community. back into it, but I think having this conversation today is like giving me a bit of a rocket, to be perfectly honest with you. I hope so. I hope so. Well, it would be, you know, um, I think some of, some of our most popular things that we do now are the weekend trips where we take students down to uh, Naruma on the south coast and we dive with the seals there and we have a campfire and mulled wine and pizza and ice bars and it's just like... Sounds right up my street, to be fair. It's <laughs> so much fun. It's so much fun and it's, it's not pretentious. You know, it's a really simple weekend, but um, everybody walks away from that weekend with new friends Um new relationships in, in some instances. Oh, really? Turns out free diving is like a great way to meet a future partner. Look, Bella, I've got just one more question. Yeah. This sure. evening, thanks for coming on. You've been a great guest. What would you tell someone who's thinking of giving free diving a go for the first time? I would tell them, I know that it seems crazy and I know that it seems scary and I was there once as well, but you have no idea what your body is capable of. And when you get to that point, that point of calm and peace and quiet and honestly shock at what your body is doing, I don't know another feeling on earth. I don't know a quicker way of accessing like euphoria. So um, I think it's okay to be scared. It's okay to be worried about it, but you might find something that changes your life by jumping in the water and giving it a go as as long as you're doing it safely that's the key thing Bella that's a beautiful place to leave it thank you very much for coming on for a chat it's been lovely talking to you thank you so much and I hope that we get you back in the water soon me too yes me too and good luck with the merger thank you so much thanks Bella cheers thanks